so good morning everyone uh yes. aap logo training session matlab kaise lag rahe hain sir agar ha ha sir dekha jaye to bahut better lag raha hai hamare ko bhi okay actually hum wo try kar rahe hain ki very basic se hum thoda thoda aage advance pe badhte jaye ha sir abhi the best दो घंटे की क्लास या या है एक्चुअली दो घंटे की क्लास में बहुत डिफिकल्ट होता है कि हम मतलब सारी चीजें ठीक से कवर कर सकें लेकिन इसीलिए हम रिकॉर्डेड लेक्चर सारे यूट्यूब पे अपलोड कर रहे हैं yes, तो sir. इस ट्रेनिंग के बाद में भी जब भी आपको टाइम मिलता है तो हमेशा उन चीजों को प्रैक्टिस करते रहिए तो सून विल बी डॉक्टर आलोक विल ज्वाइन अस तो लेट्स वेट थोड़ा पार्टिसिपेंट से भी रिक्वेस्ट है कि आप है ना जो डिस्कशन डिस्कशन होते हैं तो उनमें एक्टिवली पार्टिसिपेट करें कि जितने भी स्पीकर्स आते हैं आप उनसे इंटरेक्ट कीजिए जब भी उनका सेशन ओवर होता है तो जब भी सेशन ओवर होता है तो जितने स्पीकर्स हैं आप उनसे डिस्कस करें चीजें हेलो डॉक्टर विजय हेलो डॉक्टर कपिल हाउ आर यू गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर सॉरी फॉर द डिले एक्चुअली देयर वाज सम टेक्निकल ग्लिच सो आई कुड नॉट जॉइन इन नॉर्मल सर यू आर ऑन टाइम सर नो इशू सर ओके सो शुड वी स्टार्ट और वी शुड वेट फॉर सम टाइम जस्ट वेट एंड सर सो अगेन गुड मॉर्निंग ऑल ऑफ यू सो वी आर वेरी फॉर्चूनेट टू हैव डॉक्टर आलोक uh shiv sir vidas and uh, without uh, any further ado i invite dr alok uh, sir to deliver a lecture sir please thank you so much dr vijay a very good friend of mine dr kapil chaudhary is there i can see some of the brilliant faces over here so uh, good morning to everyone as uh, today is our topic is ngs data handling so uh, i'll be Uh, elaborating the different NGS techniques, the methods their uh, chemistry of uh, their evolution has been done, and uh, what are their applications in the uh, genomic assisted breeding. So uh, I'll I'll be sharing my slides. Okay, is it visible to all? Yes, sir, visible. Okay, so uh, once again, welcome everyone. So today, today uh, I'll be talking to you about the next generation sequencing methods and uh, their data handling. After the sequencing, uh, uh, the data we are getting, how we can handle them. 
though it is a very lengthy topic, so I'll try to cover it as early as in a, a very simple manner. So uh, basically, we'll be seeing the sequencing history, the evolution of sequencing technology. Uh, we'll be seeing the different NGS methods, uh, the revolution starting from the single sequencing and to the nanopore, and uh, in short, the bioinformatic analysis of NGS data. So coming to the sequencing, uh, first of all, let, let us understand what is sequencing. So basically the sequencing is simply the determination of order of nucleotide in the fragment of DNA. So for example, you have a large chunk of DNA and you, you want to know what is exact order of ATGC in that. Uh, th this, is, this is called sequencing, to know the exact order. And why this is important? Because uh, if you know the sequence, then only it creates some meaning. Uh, you must have studied all the genetic code and all. Okay, if there is a proper genetic code, then only it will uh, code uh, amino acid and then for the protein and which protein which work as an enzyme and for then reaction will take place. And if uh, any stop code will come, then the reaction will stop and uh, the, the function of that gene or the protein will stop. That's why it is very important to understand the sequence uh, of the, uh, the DNA uh, and based on that there has multiple applications. So this is sequencing. Then what is NGS? Next generation sequencing because the sequencing uh, has been revolutionized so much from the 1918 when it has been started with the Sanger, uh, Maxim and Gilbert who has developed the uh, Sanger sequencing. So and the modern sequencing method which are high throughput and they, which are very uh, advanced and with the low cost available and in a very few time uh, they are giving us the sequencing data. These are called as the next generation sequencing methods. So if you'll see the history of uh, sequencing methods, uh, it has started with the single sequencing method. Uh, uh, I, I believe that most of the person uh, might, might be knowing about the single sequencing method. So uh, I, I won't go in detail. So in short, these single sequencing methods uh, utilize the DD NTPs, that is right deoxynucleotide phosphate. As we know that the deoxy means there is only one H absent in the three prime end. But if there is a two end and the three end, if there is a no oxygen, it is called as a DD NTP. So there are four tubes and in each tube there are different, you know, DD NTPs are added. And uh, so there will be a law uh, when DD NTPs uh, will be added there will be no further reaction. If it is uh, DNTPs, the reaction will continue because in the in each tube, there is uh, your fragment is there, fragment of DNA is there, and all the nucleotides are there. Uh, your all enzymes are there. So reaction will continue when normal uh, your uh, NTPs will come. When DDNTPs will come, this reaction will stop. And similarly, in each tube, you'll be having fragments of DNA. And uh, with the help of uh, this uh, electrophoresis, then we are determining the order of the bases. So this is how Sanger sequencing works. Uh, coming to the rate of sequencing over the past 30 years, uh, as I was mentioning, it has started long, ba uh, long back in 1918, where we were using the gel based system. And uh, initially it was a manual system, but it got automatized over the year. In 1919, we were having the automated slab gel. And from the slab gel, we moved to the capillary sequencing, where we had the first capillary sequencing and the second capillary sequencer. But after this, the revolution has come after 2008, where the massively parallel sequencing uh, has been started, where we could have the multiple uh, uh, output and uh, therefore we could, you know, uh, sequence in real time. Then even nowadays we are able to sequence a single molecule. So this is in generation the evolution of the sequencing started with the gel-based system to the massive, massively parallel sequencing. If you see the sequencing cost with the time, uh, in, in 2001 where we took around 11 years with so much cost involved in it, uh, if you'll see, uh, within a few hours, in fact, we, we are able to sequence our data. It depends on the genome size and uh, obviously the complexity. So here we can see uh, where uh, in Bayway 2001, where it, it took so much time and also the money. So 
so nowadays uh, every lab uh, every scientist uh, can uh, afford the sequencing and this is uh, really has revolutionized the research in the crop improvement so uh, this is the difference between the single sequencing and ngs tension machine so what happens in single sequencing and ngs the first step that is dna fragmentation is the same uh, we cannot sequence the entire DNA which is present in any organism in a single uh, go. So we have to, the first, very first step is to fragment the DNA. So first we have to fragment the DNA. So in single sequencing, after the fragmentation, we are go going for the in vivo cloning and amplification. And then cycle sequencing, that is, means uh, after every, I mean, there are, I have told you that there are different tubes, four tubes are there and he, after there is only one cycle at a time is going on and and uh, after this there will be the electrophoresis uh, through which only one read per capillary you will come to know that which base is there uh, if you see the difference in ngs after the fragmentation there will be a, a ligation of adapter and after the ligation of adapter there will be the amplification this is the main step which has revolutionized the sequencing method. So here, when uh, you'll be uh, generating the polony array, array means that means a lot of your DNA fragment is amplified at a time in a multiple time, so that you 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 are having the information about your DNA. And then instead of uh, 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 electrophoresis, which is uh, one read per capillary, you have more than million reads per array, so that simultaneously you can come to know that which base is being sequenced. So uh, what are the advantages that we'll see in case of NGS? So we can construct a library and we can have the clonal amplification to generate a sequencing features. The, it does not involve the in vivo cloning and transformation which is very uh, lengthy process and also the difficult one. Here you're getting the high degree of parallelism than the capillary based sequencing. That means uh, here only one at a time the sequence is read, but here in case there uh, simultaneously amplification is going on, and in real time we can know that uh, what is the sequence, what is the base call. So this is the NGS pipeline in general. So we we have a DNA sample, we have a huge uh, chunk of uh, DNA, and uh, uh, we we are uh, doing the library preparation. Library preparation involves the fragmentation of DNA and, uh, and ligation of adapter sequences. And after that, uh, there are different NGS instruments uh, are involved that we'll see later on. So sequencing is, uh, is done through these different NGS instrument with different chemistry sequencing chemistry, and then later on the data is analyzed. And finally, you'll be getting the uh, sequence genome like this. So uh, this is this is also a further elaboration of uh, NGS. So first is the library preparation. So library preparation involves the DNA fragmentation and adapter ligation. So here we can see these are our fragmented DNA. As I've told you earlier, we cannot uh, sequence a, a whole genome in a one go. So we have to fragment it. So this is this is uh, your fragmented DNA, and these are the adapters. So this is uh, the first step and that is called library preparation. The second step is clonal amplification. Clonal amplification is done through the either emulsion PCR or bridge PCR. This I'll explain later on uh, in, in different chemistry. Let's say for example in Illumina sequencing we are having the bridge PCR while in case of ion torrent or another we are having the emulsion PCR. And the third step is cycle array sequencing and which involves either pyrosequencing chemistry, sequencing by ligation chemistry, or sequencing by synthesis chemistry. So these, these are the different chemistry which I'll, I'll explain later on. For the algorithm, so first there will be library preparation where the DNA is fragmented and adapter is ligated, and then clonal amplification either using the emulsion PCR or bridge PCR, and finally there is a sequencing in a cyclic array there. Uh, uh, using uh, different chemistries like biosequencing, sequencing by ligation, or sequencing by synthesis using the different platforms. Uh, this is the classification of sequencing platform in general. The first generation sequencing are called as a, uh, the, uh, the Sanger sequencing, uh, which involves basically the capillary sequencing method, uh, which we have seen earlier. 
The second generation sequencing platform includes the Roche 454, which came uh, in 2005, and then Illumina, yeah, which came in 2006, ABI Solid Systems, which came in 2007, and Iron Torrent. And after that, and the third generation sequencing, which involves the helicos, fat bio, and nanopore sequencing, which uh, are able to sequence even a single molecule. Uh, coming to uh, the first platform of NGS, next generation sequencing, it is called as the Roche 454. So this is based on the scientist uh, which has invented a, uh, his name was Roche. So uh, what happens here, the adapter ligated DNA, which is around 400 to 500 square, they are fixed to the small DNA capture beads in the water. So this is this is basically the emulsion PCR. Or in a, in an emulsion PCR, imagine a, in a tube, uh, we are having the mixture of oil and water. And in a uh, water droplet, you have a bead. Like here you can see there is a bead. Okay, and in this bead, we have our fragmented DNA. Uh, which are uh, ligated with the adapters. You have DNTPs, you have enzymes, you have everything like a, a PCR, uh, uh, whatever the constituents or uh, the uh, parameters uh, which are required for the PCR, all are available in a water droplet. And this is mainly to uh, maximize the uh, amplification as there will be a lot of water droplets in a single tube, there will be a multiple uh, simultaneous amplification. So this is this is the main meaning of Emulsion PCR. So there will be uh, uh, amplification, and its chemistry is basically the sequencing by synthesis pyro sequencing. So here, what happens? Imagine, imagine. Uh, so here we can see uh, this is our fragmented DNA, right? And it is uh, ligated with the adapter, and here is your primer. And what happens here? Uh, all the four nucleotides A, T, G, C, they are added sequentially. That means one after another, and they are further extending in the uh, your DNA fragment. So I'll, I'll explain it like, say for example, here adenine is added. So if adenine is added, it will uh, release uh, the PPI, that is pyrophosphate. Okay, we know that after addition of any nucleotide, there is a release of pyrophosphate. So when this pyrophosphate is released, this enzyme APS, uh, this uh, APS enzyme is adenosine phosphosulfate. This converts the a PPI into ATP. And this ATP, uh, in the uh, ATP, uh, the enzyme sulfurase, with the help of this ATP, this converts the luciferase into oxyluciferin, which eventually gives you the light signal. So when, say, for example, adenine is added, and if adenine, if, if thymine is there in your next uh, template, then only the PPI will release and there is a signal. That means we will come to know if adenine is ad added, that means in the next side that is in your strength, that is thymine. Okay, if, and if thymine is there, then only PPI will uh, in, uh, release and then PPI will be converted into the ATP with the help of APS. And then uh, this ATP, utilizing this ATP sulfurase will convert this luciferase into oxyluciferin and uh, this oxyluciferin will give you the light signal. So this is the pyro sequencing chemistry which is also called as sequencing by synthesis. So uh, uh, is there any doubt in this Roche Pyro? Okay otherwise we will take the doubts uh, at the end of the session. So this is this is the pyro sequencing chemistry. I hope everyone has understood or any doubt we can get this later on. So it, it also like uh, the, one of the point is the signal strength is proportion to the number of nucleotides. Say for example, there is a repetition of uh, T, 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 T. Then if uh, uh, so many A has been added, then the signal strength would be the something different. If only A is added, only uh, signal strength would be the lighter side. If more A has been added, then the signal strength would be more. So this is this is the another sequencing platform ABI solid which is by the applied biosystem and the, the, the procedure is same like a DNA preparation uh, uh, DNA fragmentation then the library will be prepared the li li uh, adapter will be ligated chip will be prepared then sequencing will be done and the raw analysis uh, data analysis will be done. So here here what happens.
this added nucleotide will release the hydrogen ion. When hydrogen ion will uh, release here, there will be change in the pH. If there will be the change in the pH, the ion gradient causes the uh, change in the electricity. Okay, and this uh, ion gradient change, this will be measured by, measured by the voltmeter. Okay, say for example, uh, your template is there. And in your template, the next nucleotide is A. And if you have uh, added the new T, and it is based on the complementary, it is going to uh, going and uh, it will go and bind. It will go and bind. It will release H plus ion, and there will be change in the pH, and this will be measured by the voltmeter. If there is some wrong nucleotide and there is no complementary complementarity, so it is not going to release the H plus ion. So there will be no change, and nothing will come uh, reflect into the voltmeter. So this is uh, how this uh, ion torrent chemistry is work. So basically, based on the because uh, here we are not adding all the nucleotides uh, simultaneously. Okay, uh, we are adding adding the sequencing. So when when it, one is added, uh, so we'll come to know wherever this uh, adenine will find its complementarity any nucleotide. So there will be change, and this will be reflected into the voltmeter. And similarly, here also the signal strength is proportional to the number of nucleotide added. Say for example, there is. A, uh, repeat is there. Say, for example, T T T T is there, and a lot of T N T Ps are added. Then obviously there there will be a release of more of H plus, and uh, it will cause more change in the ion gradient, and therefore this uh, this will reflect it into the board. So in between, before also there are some uh, uh, platforms like SMRT single molecule real time sequencing, but all they are not of much uh, application and they they haven't been they haven't been much utilized in for the problem domain and other. So uh, I'll I'll be coming ultimately to the nanopore DNA sequencing methods, which is uh, the most advanced system uh, in case of MTS uh, sequencing method. So uh, the nanopore why it is called as a nanopore because it is a very a very small protein complex which is uh, attached to a membrane. Here here we can see uh, there is a membrane and th there are two proteins. One protein is there which is unzipping the DNA because your DNA is there into the double helical. So it will unzip and your one uh, uh, strand will go through this. And the second protein th this creates the pore in the membrane. Where through which your DNA will pass. Okay, so what happens here? So the the concept or the chemistry is that because there is an ion flow from uh, one side of the membrane to the another side of the membrane. Okay, simply just imagine there is a flow of ion from this side to this side. When adenine is there in this uh, uh, protein complex, so the rate of uh, flow of ion from one side to another side is different. When adenine is there. When guanine is there, the flow is different. When cytosine is added, the flow is different. And similarly, uh, so uh, the purpose is, or the meaning is, all the four nucleotide causes the change of flow of ion from one side to another side to a different level. And this change in the flow will create a difference in the current. It's like in the last system also, when uh, H plus ion from one side to uh, another side, uh, if it will generate, then there will be change in the current, and this change in the current will be measured like this. So, for example, if uh, the uh, the change in the current, the change in the flow is different. So, for example, here you can say T for T there is a change in different. This is the change for G there is a little change, and for A there is a a different change. So similarly, when uh, adenine will come, it will uh, the flow of ion from one pole, uh, one side to the another side will be different. For G, it is different, and C and T, and similarly, it will be different. So this is the chemistry of nanopore DNA sequencing. This is a very a small uh, size machine uh, uh, as compared to the conventional uh, sequencing platform. They are so big, but this is a very short. Uh, very, I mean, we can keep it in a table. So this is the most advanced uh, system, nanopore sequencing method. Uh, so uh, we'll see the comparison of all NGS platform. 
So, as I was talking, the cost is the major factor in case of the sequencing because uh, if if the cost is less, then only we can go because we we have a very uh, complex polyploid genome also. So, in general, uh, we we can find the cost is uh, low in case of single sequencing, but generally. If we have to uh, sequence a very short stature of DNA, then only we are going for the single sequencing. Otherwise, for high throughput sequencing, generally we are going for the Illumina because uh, there are certain reasons because uh, the, the cost is uh, comparatively uh, low, as but ABI solid and iron torrent, they are also okay, okay. And helicos and uh, uh, pack bio, the cost is very much higher. And the quality of data we are getting from Illumina sequencing is uh, is very uh, comparatively less as compared to the uh, helicos and paired biosystems. That's why uh, we are going generally for the Illumina platform. So uh, this is uh, the pipeline that after sequencing uh, the data, uh, how we are uh, doing the bioinformatic analysis of uh, NGS data. So. Uh, after uh, okay, after this uh, sequencing, these uh, your uh, sequence is called as a read, and uh, these reads because these reads has been read by your sequence platform, and after that there will be the uh, quality check and uh, pre-processing of the data. Quality check means whether the calling has been done proper, whether the sequencing has been done proper or not, and there are there are different. Quality check parameter for this. Say for example, they will check the uh, Q30 value. They will check for the GC percentage. They will check for whether the uh, is there any error percentage or not. So these are some of the quality check. And after that, uh, there will be pre-processing of the data, which involves uh, removal of adapter sequences. Remember when uh, when we were uh, sequencing the data in library preparation stage. Uh, after the fragmentation of data, we are uh, we are we were adding the adapter. Okay, so we have to remove those adapter adapter sequence. Yes, adapter sequence is very common. So there are some platforms like uh, some tools like Trimomatic and other. With the help of those uh, tools, we can remove the adapter sequences. So after this, the uh, file will be converted into the fastq file. This is in the uh, the same file, but it is along with your quality data. Okay. And after this, we'll have the assembly and alignment. So assembly is like, uh, list, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, because we have large stretch of DNA and we have fragmented it. And now we have to align it because we want a continuous stretch, like uh, from one end to the another end, what is the sequence of ATGC? So we have to align it in a proper way so that it should give a proper meaning. So, uh, and we'll also see the assembly. Uh, assembly means uh, that we have to uh, assemble all the fragmented DNA. Aligning means uh, we, we, uh, if there are two types of uh, uh, alignment. Otherwise, uh, one is reference-based alignment and de novo alignment. We will we'll see. So after this, uh, it will be converted into the same file and using the same tool in which it will be. So these are the different name of the file and which have different features. Okay. Once you start to uh, 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 analyze your data, uh, you will come to know. So finally, finally, uh, your data will be uh, stored in the form of PCF, variant calling format, a variant calling form, where uh, where you will come to know that uh, after uh, multiple alignment, your uh, reads are uh, annotating with which uh, channel. And lastly, uh, it will be stored into the GFF and with the help of IGB tool, uh, here you can see uh, that which base are there and in, in which base uh, is uh, there are different signal intensity. So this is in general uh, the pipeline how after the sequencing the, we can see uh, visualize actually of the uh, sequencing data. So I was talking about the alignment and assembly. So alignment there are two types of uh, alignment here uh, reference based you know. So these are the reads. These means your sequence uh, DNA. So here, if you have the reference genome, say for example in wheat rice, and most of the crops is available reference genome. So we can align them with your reference genome. Then only will have any in, uh, meaningful information that this is this is the sequence which belongs to the. Because say for example, if you take any 
uh, any DNA fragment, if you will sequence, it, it is not going to give you any information, simply ATGC. But if you will align it to the some a reference genome of any crop or any uh, individual organism, then only it is going to give you the information. And assembly, uh, de novo assembly, where you don't have the reference genome, uh, there we are going for the de novo assembly. Uh, de novo means it is a novel because we don't have the reference genome. And there are, uh, if we see the de novo assembly, it is done using the paired and the met pair library. So, uh, what is the difference between paired and a met pair library? So, in, in uh, paired and library, the, the gap is comparatively higher in case of the uh, met pair library, and it is generally recommended. Uh, so, uh, your reads are there. When your reads are resolved, it becomes the context. And after the context, uh, this this further, uh, I'll give you the, it will give you the context, will be the scaffold, and the scaffold further are uh, categorized into the chromosome. So this is how it goes. So these are the different bioinformatics tools for NGS data analysis for alignment. We are using these tools. Uh, alignment and variant detection, MEQ. Uh, these are the different uh, tools uh, for assembly, base color, and variant detection. Coming to the most important part, application of the next generation sequencing. So these are the different uh, categories like complete genome. We, in fact, we can resequence them and uh, reduce representation sequencing. Say, for example. Uh, if the genome size is too large and we 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 want to have some other information in our uh, we don't have not much budget then in case we are generally going for the reduced representation sequencing just to have the representation so this is in, uh, important uh, this, this has an application in large scale polymorphism discovery similarly like we can go for genomic resequencing paired and resequencing uh, metagenomic sequencing, like if we want to discover the infectious and commercial flora, we can go for the transcriptome to know the gene expression and uh, splicing variation. Small RNA sequencing, if you go for micro RNA, which are very important uh, uh, player nowadays. And if you want to know uh, the epigenetic variation, then also you have a chip sequencing, bisulfate sequencing and also the molecular barcoding and uh, nucleation uh, positioning. So these are the different uh, applications of the next generation sequencing and which is further going to be uh, uh, strengthened in, in due course of time. So this is this figure explains the role of NGS in genomic assisted breeding. So say for example, you have a genetic resources, uh, you have a diverse gem plasm panel, uh, you have uh, rails, you have rails, you have magic population, NAM population, you have mutants or training population. So with the help of NGS, we can genotype and with the help of phenomics too, we can phenotype them. And uh, with that, we can use, uh, then further we can use uh, GVAS, we can use bioparental cutel mapping, uh, association mapping, telling, genome-wide association studies. And these information, uh, uh, will be utilized in uh, marker assisted breeding or genomic assisted breeding value will be calculated and uh, with the help of this uh, will will identify those marker which are identified through the MAS will be utilized in marker selection or genomic estimated breeding value will be utilized for the genomic selection and further we can identify those genotypes which are having the high breeding value and those uh, and those uh, genotype will be used for the processing. So here the role comes of NGS. Uh, I mean, before this NGS, we were just uh, doing through the PCR and other methods, but nowadays uh, we, we can come to know each uh, uh, the, the sequence of uh, any genotype in a very short period of time, in a very low cost. So it has really revolutionized the genomic assisted breeding. So future thrust it will see there's a need to develop NGS platform which combines the accuracy of Sanger method and high throughput of advanced platform. Though Sanger sequencing method is low throughput, but its accuracy is very high. Because in, in, in uh, uh, high throughput platform, uh, there are more chances of error as compared to Sanger sequencing. So it, 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 uh, it, it is required that we, we can club the accuracy of Sanger method and high throughputness of advanced platform. New library preparation method and bioinformatic tools to be uh, developed with re 
reduced cost. Uh, obviously, because in library preparation also a lot of chemicals and other things are required, so uh, there, there is a need to reduce the cost. And there is a need of massive reorganization of the way. Uh, okay, so uh, obviously this is all for us, but uh, uh, we need to get trained uh, in, in uh, NGS platform, how this NGS platform is really working and how to uh, handle the data. Because uh, uh, mostly we are we are doing the things conventionally uh, uh, by phenotypic characterization. If we could combine the NGS data with this, so it will really help us to gain the joint gain. So thank you so much. Uh, I would like to end my presentation with the very famous quote of Dobzhensky: "Nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. Everything is happening in biology. It is it is related with the." evolution we have to connect with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. If any doubt or anything is there, you yes. are welcome. Hello sir, what is the resequencing? Is there any difference between sequencing and resequencing, sir? Uh, speak loud. Is there anyone saying something? Sir, resequencing. You said the word resequencing. So he asking for resequencing, sir. Okay, okay. So resequencing is basically basically when uh, you have a, you know uh, already uh, before uh, this those you know which has been already sequenced and uh, if you want to uh, have the information from those data in another context like if uh, just a minute. See, here you can see the targeted genome resequencing. When we are going for the resequencing, we are not going for the whole genome. We are just targeting the only uh, uh, very small stretch of DNA, and this is basically for the targeted moly, uh, polymorphism and mutation discovery. So, this is resequencing is generally used for the targeted polymorphism discovery and mutation discovery. What is the whole sequencing, whole genome sequencing? What's the difference between both the things? Whole genome sequencing? Yes, sir. Whole genome sequencing, that means you're sequencing your entire genome. Say, mm -hmm. for example, uh, in case of human genome, so all the chromosome, all whole DNA will be, you know, fragmented and, uh, uh, and all the information starting from the first chromosome to the last chromosome, the whole genome will be sequenced. But if, if you have information, say for example, you have find uh, some important gene on your chromosome number, uh, uh, I mean seven of the week, okay. So if you want to pinpoint or you have want to information about that particular chromosome and that reason only, then you go for that particular reason sequencing, resequence, targeted genome resequencing. So every time we are not going. So in whole genome sequencing, generally we are going when there is no information available. Okay, this is the first uh, first time you're doing in any crop. Then only we are going for the whole genome. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Comment section one participant asked, sir, which method is cost effective as well as with high accuracy percentage? Uh, Vijay, your your voice is not audible enough. Mm -hmm. Actually, one participant has asked that, uh, sir, which sequencing method is cost effective as well as with high accuracy percentage? Hmm. Which which method is cost effective as well as? Yeah. And high accuracy. Okay. So, in general, I mean, uh, what I have seen, uh, this is Illumina. Illumina is the most uh, sequencing uh, method, which is a cost effective as well as the, uh, the accurate one. Uh, though in in case I mean in in case of alumina the cost is little bit higher but scientists are preferring the quality so in case of uh, alumina the the quality data is good I mean the data is the quality one data that's why people are going for it and it is on a just a little bit higher side. So okay. If you have no query, then sir, I want to first of all express our sincere gratitude to, to our one of the favorite senior, Dr. Alok sir, sir, for your 
excellent brilliant lecture on such a complex topic like gene next generation sequencing technique and under which you cover topics like evolution of sequence technique comparison between various nsc bi tools so thank you sir for sharing your expertise and motivating each participant to explore into wonders of uh, genetic research so and we are fortunate to have you today sir thank you sir thank you so much kapil thank you so much uh, dr vijay for this opportunity and then it was nice interacting to you i mean thank in future you. also if any such activities are there i think uh, i'll be there yeah thank you definitely you. okay so uh, next actually sir, sir one more question what's about mute map role is ka sir brief Sir, please one more insight on mute map techniques. Mute map. Yes, sir. Yeah, mute map is there for the discovery of uh, mutation. So uh, here also it involves the sequencing. So this is this is basically for the identification of mutation. And uh, I mean, if you see, uh, there are different methods of uh, discovery of mutation, and this is this is the advanced one. You'll find the mute map, mute map plus, mute map gap. So they, these are the different variations. They are the mainly variant of bulk aggregate analysis. So, okay, basis for mute map, mute map, gap, different parameters. Yes. So, Abhijit, thank you, Abhi. Abhijit, Abhijit, I think the yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, na. So, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Okay. Okay. आप ज्वाइन रखना चाहते हैं तो ज्वाइन रखिए सर ओके ओके आई विल स्टॉप शेयर हां ओके स्टॉप सर ओके थैंक यू सर सो पार्टिसिपेंट्स नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल फॉर द नेक्स्ट लेक्चर ओवर वन ऑफ द बेस्ट फ्रेंड डॉक्टर अभिजीत हु नाउ वर्किंग एज आईसीआर आईआरआई आशा एंड ही विल डिलीवर लेक्चर ऑन जीवास मास प्रैक्टिकल सेशन मेनली एंड सो अभिजीत प्लेटफार्म इज योर्स यू कैन स्टार्ट Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kabul. I uh, will share. The, uh, can you enable me to uh, share the screen? Yeah. Uh, my. hope my screen is visible right yes visible yeah okay so uh thank you kapil and vijay uh, uh hi friends uh, good afternoon to everyone so uh yeah in coming yeah, you know in one hour or so i will be talking about genome wide association studies in crop breeding and what is the premises of jivas and why we have to go for jivas and what is the advantage of jivas over biparental mapping and then uh, we'll be briefly talking about haplotype breeding and uh, then a uh, few you know i will demonstrate how we do jivas and uh, how we process the data and how we go for the jivas so i would welcome you all and okay uh, why we have to map a trait Uh, for a breeder's perspective it's very important to map the trait right uh, the first and uh, important criteria first and uh, important aspect is to understand the genetic basis of the trait so genetic basis of the trait it tells about you know uh, the mode of inheritance of the trait whether it's polygenic or oligogenic and mode of gene action and it is very essential to exploit the trait and also to manipulate the uh, particular genomic region for enhance uh, enhancement of the trait now it also will help uh, the precision at which the breeders uh, do breeding so your utilization of uh, finding the mapping the trait of interest and uh, mapping the molecular markers associated with the trait will enable uh, you know uh, we can screen the traits uh multiple traits over differing environments without any interference from the environmental effects and also 
this will accelerate the breeding program. The breeder can enable uh, phenotyping the you know thousands of individuals at one go. Also, it is not just one trait is important for you know uh, releasing a, or developing a superior variety. It is a combination of multiple superior elite traits. So mapping the trait will easily enable or it easily will help the breeder to stock the different different traits into a, a superior variety. Now mapping the trait, uh, there are uh, basically there are two types of approaches to map a trait. Uh, sorry. So yeah, uh, there are two uh, two approaches to map a trait. The first one is uh, linkage mapping or QTL mapping, or yeah, it's a uh, biparental mapping. And second approach is association mapping. Now, uh, when we talk about QTL mapping, uh, here we can see that uh, we are here involving uh, two parents, the parent one and parent two. The parent one may be carrying our trait of interest and parent two will be carrying its contrasting trait. For example, resistance and uh, susceptibility. Uh, the parent one may be carrying the resistance and parent two should carry the susceptible genes. Now, when we cross these two, uh, two parents, you can see that in F1, uh, the heteros it will be in a heterozygous way and upon selfing it, it will attain homozygosity. So each selfing, uh, you know, and from here onwards, from F1 onwards, each selfing will ensure that the recombination will be taking place uh, you know, in each recombination cycle. And upon uh, attaining the homozygosity, this collection of these inbred lines, right? Uh, all this collection of inbred lines, we call it as recombinant inbred lines or simply rills. And when you look at these inbred lines, you can find that the genomic regions have been recombined in each of these lines, right? Uh, the next step is to phenotype these recombinant inbred lines and also genotype them to uh, ascertain the level of recombination happened uh, using the molecular markers in each of these lines. And then we combine the phenotypic and genotypic data for the association analysis or QTL analysis to identify our region of interest, to narrow down our region of interest. Uh, however, there is a slight problem in QTL mapping, a slight, you know, uh, uh, here you can see that even you can map the genomic region, uh, you are actually mapping a big chunk of region. So the reason behind this, I will explain in the next slide. So uh, uh, if you focus on this uh, B, the picture B here, real mapping population, uh, here you are crossing two parents, and these two parents are, uh, again, here you can see that undergoing recombinations uh, for those regions which they are differing. And uh, when they attain homozygosity, you know, almost the most of the recombination has been took place here. However, you see that only few rounds of recombination are happening here. It means that your G, uh, region of your interest, or your actual genomic region which governing the trait, which is involving a fewer round of recombination or the genomic region and its vicinity, they're undergoing, there is less chance that there are recombinations are happening in those regions due to number of recombination cycle is less, right? Due to which your gene is or your QTL is mapped in a, uh, you know, a larger window or larger interval. So there we can say that the QTL resolution here is less. Now coming to the second picture, right? This is a collection of uh, diverse uh, uh, gemplasm lines. So here, they are, th these are all homologous chromosome of a diverse germplasm lines. So each line, uh, you know, each chromosome, you know, uh, segment represent each lines. So they have been undergoing recombination even since the time immemorial. And each part, if you, uh, you know, uh, if you check uh, in a, uh, as a, you know, population as such, every individual must have been undergone some uh, recombination at some point of, you know, some part of the chromosome. So if you take any part of the chromosome, you can find that there is considerable amount of recombination at, you know, members of this population. So due to which 
you can map your genomic region in at sub centimorgan level or other words we can say that here you can map the genomic region at high resolution now coming to the genome wide association studies the major advantage here is you don't need to develop a mapping population at all here the mapping population uh, the diverse germplasm itself you can use it as a mapping population and also this is much more helpful in case of annuals perennials vegetatively propagating crops the reason is here you don't have to cross them and develop a mapping population otherwise it would have taken you know so many years to develop such kind of mapping population and also uh, as we have discussed here uh, they use as evolutionary recombination and mutation events thereby the resolution of the qtls will be high and also not just germplasm even the diverse breeding lines which are arises from multi parental crosses also can be used here and uh, another advantage here is uh, in linkage mapping you can maximum detect only two alleles but, uh, since only two parents are involved here and but in diverse germplasms you can detect as many as multi you know you can detect multiple alleles governing a particular trait now uh, there is an important aspects of association studies is the principle is linkage disequilibrium so to explain the linkage disequilibrium let's see uh, a, this particular case uh, here we can see that there are eight individuals right and this eight individuals carrying a, uh, there are two local uh, loci here a and c and uh, these two loci are in different combinations in eight individuals and if you check the frequencies of this eight in uh, this eight combinations you can find that uh, there are uh, basically there are four combination a and c a and t g and c and g and t so if you check the frequencies of these four combinations you find that these are the you know total uh, all possible combinations are here so all these combinations are you know existing in equal frequencies right every combination has equal chance for their existence so yeah it comes around 0.25 right a and c is 0.25 a and t is 0.25 so uh, so do g and c and g and t so this state we call it as linkage equilibrium now uh, when we look up uh, look this case too you can find that there are predominantly only two combination exist in this population a and t and g and c and which is, and there are no other combination so it means that wherever there is a the t is inheriting and wherever there is g the c is inheriting along with it so it means that this is violating the law you know the this is violating the law uh, linkage equilibrium so do we call it as linkage disequilibrium and uh, in other words linkage disequilibrium is the non random association between two loci or two markers in a random mating population now how we can use it in a association mapping suppose you have identified you have phenotyped this eight individuals and identified you have struck an association between this uh, green seed coat color and yellow seed coat color and then it means that your uh, the loci which which are in ld is associated with this particular trait which indicating uh, yeah if this particular genetic variant influence uh, influences a trait in ld with a marker in a jivas analysis then this particular uh, snp uh, will be appear to be associated with the trait so this is the basic of uh, association studies now another important aspect of uh, yeah uh, along with ld there is an ld dk this concept of ld dk says that uh, in a population uh, it's a rate of uh, you know reduction of linkage disequilibrium as the genetic distance between the marker increases right now uh, to practically when we look about ld dk so uh, there are two you can see that there are two figures here and uh, in this first figure uh, you, you see here the you know here if you just check yeah so uh, the bottom you know curve uh, the maximum LDDK you are here you can find is at r square at 0.5 so LDDK we estimated when the ld plummet to half 
ld uh, you know reduce it to half so here the maximum is 0.5 so when we check about 0.25 which comes around here it comes uh, 300 kb right now in the second figure uh the maximum ld decay registered at 0.7 r square value at 0.7 and then it plummet to 0.35 at 1.8 mb right now it has both are extremely different scenarios now if i explain this the first figure uh, at 300 kb your ld is decaying to half it means that there is a chance for recombination at every 300 okay in other words a 300 kb chunk of you know uh, you know genetic material or 300 kb chunk of you know chromosome portion is moving as a single ld block or else we can say that here the ld block size we can calculate as 300 kb here it is 1.8 mb and how it is possible both are in rice and they even though they're showing different ld the reason is number of recombination event happened in this population is too high and this is a gemplasm population and this is a uh, you know multiparental population so here number of recombination event has been you know happened so high that uh, the ld block size has reduced into 300 kb however this population has been created very recently and the number of recombination event is possibly a, you know 5 or 6 happen here so due to which uh, the ld block size is 1.8 mb so it tells a lot about the population now the significance here why we need to estimate this in gvc is for example if you identified a significant market rate association and you want to uh, you know you uh, once you identify a significant market rate association and identified a significant snp then uh, you want to check whether this SNP has associated with the, any uh, non-candidate genomic region or not. So for that, here you need to search within this 300 KB visibility, uh, vicinity. But here you have to search whether the 1.8 MB vicinity of the SNP uh, upstream and downstream to add, a, you know, uh, to search for the, uh, you know, possible candidate genes. Okay, so uh, the uh, LD has been affected by so many factors. One is mating pattern. Uh, conventionally speaking, uh, in cell pollinated crops are experiencing much less LD uh, decay compared to cross pollinated crops. Since they are heterozygous, may, uh, there are more number of recombination events will happen. So LD decay will be faster there. And recombination rate, as the you have higher recombination rate, your LD will be lesser and population history, which we have discussed about. The populations which we have undergone less number of recombination cycle, we have uh, higher LD block size and, uh, you know, uh, and another aspect is selection. Uh, selection, uh, there are one terminology called epistatic selection. Epistatic selection indicating that, uh, if for example, there are two loci, okay? One, one of the loci is, uh, both of the loci are controlling the trait. But if, even if you select for loci A, uh, you will be indirectly selecting for loci B because they will be inheriting together since the expression of trait is dependent upon both the loci. So it's called epistatic selection. So this will increase the LD between loci A and B, even if they are located in a different chromosomes. Now, uh, genomic region some of the genomic regions are prone to more ld decay than other genomic region generally they say the genome the gene rich genomic regions are undergone uh, more number of recombination event and thereby there will be low ld there compared to the gene poor region where they have been undergone less number of uh, recombination cycles now uh, when we come about, when we talk about uh, a general outline of jivas we have already talked about the population, kind of population we can use in GWAS. And also phenotypic data is very important to get a reliable, for if your trait is agromorphological trait, you need to evaluate your trait in multiple environment over multiple years, multiple seasons, multiple locations. That will give you much robust, reliable data. And markers here, since your population, you know, uh, uh, the, num uh, the number of markers to be used in GWAS depends upon the population. Generally, we recommend there should be high-density marker panel should be used for 
to you know construct the genotypic data and also if your population is the you know ld dk is high that is means that ld block size is less it means that you need to use much more number of markers and uh, with using this phenotypic and genotypic data then we can proceed for the jivas analysis and also this models uh, jivas and uh, the models we will be discussing it in the coming slides now once you get significant market rate associations uh, there will be always questions about its actual causal relationship, whether it is an actual causal relationship or it is just a false discovery. So there are so many factors involved uh, in GWAS to obstruct the uh, you know actual discoveries. So how to deal with that? The major problem is in any GWAS study is population structure. So population structure is uh, basically uh, a homogeneous subpopulation existing within a population. So due to its genetic relatedness. So suppose if you have a population of 100 individuals, if your population is genetically divided into three, 30, 30, and uh, 40 individuals. So that kind of scenario is called that. It means that there is a population structure existing in your population, right? Now, how it will obstruct uh, Jiva's results is uh, for example, if your population has here, if you see here, red and blue is two different sub two different subpopulations, and uh, the red subpopulation is having A allele more common, and uh, blue subpopulation is having G allele more common. Then, uh, then when we investigate a trait and you strike a cause, uh, you know, uh, result with this particular locus then uh, it is rather than an actual causal relationship the association between genetic variant and trait will be due to this population structure rather than the actual causal relationship to circumvent this we uh, we have to incorporate q matrix or pca into the study so q matrix is basically a structure output it says that what is the membership fraction of each subpopulation of each individuals and uh, PCA, uh, probably, uh, I think the, you know, previous uh, uh, previous session, you must have, you know, uh, you must have heard about what is PCA and what is significance. PCA also tells about the same thing, uh, the structure of the population. Now, uh, another problem is familiar relatedness. It's the same thing. For example, if your, uh, if your population use it for GWAS, uh, okay, one, one thing I would like to tell that, okay, uh, uh, one, uh, how to circumvent this? There is a population structure problem. There are two ways. Uh, for example, if your population is large enough, we advise to do GWAS in each subpopulation separately, then to the combine the result. And another way is, uh, uh, you know, use appropriate model which account this uh, population structure. Uh, thereby, you can, you know, get actual discovery and reduce these false discoveries. Yeah, so coming to familiar, uh, familial uh, relatedness, again, the problem is same. If your fa particular genetic variant is more common in a family, uh, and that family has a uh, high incidence of a particular trait. For example, your population is having a three, four families, and one of the family is having A allele more, and that family is somehow registered to have more resistance, uh, disease resistant. Then this association between genetic variant and disease resistant may be due to that familial relatedness rather than the actual causal relationship. So here we have to calculate the kinship matrix. So kinship matrix will tell that uh, each individual, how they're related using statistical data. So the, if we incorporate kinship matrix into the model, uh, we can deal with this familial relatedness. Okay, another problem is uh, uh, multiple testing. Because each GWAS involves large number of markers, we know that anywhere between thirty thousand to fifty thousand markers. If you use, it means that you are each time you are conducting thirty thousand to fifty thousand tests. So more number of tests are conducted, the greater the likelihood of finding a significant association by just chance alone. It could be just a chance. So how to correct this? Uh, there are, you know, several corrections are available: bond Ferroni correction, fault discovery rate correction. And another one is Benjamin Hochenberg correction. So among this bond Ferroni correction is more stringent. Uh, yeah, we'll be discussing about these two. 
now again technical error also can lead to fault discoveries uh, genotyping error phenotyping error so the breeder should know about you know how to minimize the phenotyping error conduct the experiments in multiple locations or uh, multiple environments get a robust data choose a appropriate experimental design which can account the error variance so all this can reduce if you take proper care uh, this is an error which you can easily rectify uh, now talking about statistical models in jivas i, I would briefly outline uh, even though i am not a bioinformatician in a breeder's perspective i would like to explain a little bit of the statistical models there are basically uh, uh, two models in the beginning uh, the first one was general linear model so general linear model uh, it assumes that uh, it consider population structure it takes care accounts the population structure into the model uh, but not kinship right and uh, it assumes that marker and trait relationship is uh, linear and additive and so it cannot encounter the confounding factors uh, which obstruct this uh, jivas and uh, another one is mixed linear model and mixed linear model uh, you know it is basically a mixed model analysis it takes uh, both you know it, it takes account for both fixed effects and random effects and uh, yeah it consider both population structure and kinship as cofactors into account uh, you know to reduce the fault discoveries and these two models are single locus models and single locus model means uh, these models are uh, these models consider that uh, it basically test association between a single marker and a trait however multi locus uh, multiple loci models they test association between multiple markers and a trait simultaneously and multiple uh, loci models uh, several models are available uh, have been developed recently uh, ml mm farm cpu blink so uh, uh, accordingly uh, the the models with higher statistical and computing efficiency if you say uh, the higher one is blink then come farm cpu then comes ml mm so blink is uh, since its computing efficiency is good it is good for uh, doing GWAS in a large data sets. And uh, yeah, so once you get the market trade association, there are two figures you should be very carefully looking for. One is your, this is your, first one is your QQ plot. This is uh, your Manhattan plot. Now uh, the Manhattan plot, you can see a, you know, a black line. This black line is a uh, bond Ferroni correction. Bond Ferroni correction we can easily calculate. It is a uh, zero five divided by uh, number of markers and uh, minus logarithm of that. For example, in this case, it will be around five point eight something. So, uh, so the markers, uh, the uh, these are all the probabilities basically. So the markers which qualify this particular uh, above, you know, this threshold, you can consider them as you know significant market rate associations. Now, uh, yeah, observing, you know, checking the QQ plot is very important. This is a very ideal QQ plot, which you can see here, where, uh, can you see this red line? And your mark, your probability distribution is exactly along this red line, right? And then there is a deviation. These are all your market rate association, significant association. Suppose if your QQ plot is deviating very early from uh, very deviating, uh, you know, away from this expected probability distribution, and there is something wrong with your analysis. Probably, uh, you know, there is a problem with the structure or familiar relatedness, or you have to recheck your phenotypic and genotypic data. Right. Now, once you identify your putative, uh, once you identify, you know, your market rate association, next step is since it's a, you are using SNPs, you will be knowing its physical locations. So, using the physical location, there are for example, in case of rice, maize, uh, I think almost all the crops genome browsers are available. You can search uh, for a putative candidate genes which are located in the vicinity of these particular, uh, you know, genomic regions. And how to search? For example, if you have identified at, you know, a particular, uh, for example, uh, uh, you identified 
25 MP, something you identified a gene, uh, identified a market rate association, uh, then you can, uh, in case of rice, if, if then if you did a LDT analysis and you found that it's a 250 KB is your, uh, you know, LD block size, then two point, uh, 25 MB plus 250 KB, 25 MB minus 250 KB. In this interval, you can search for a gene of interest. Probably you'll be finding it. And okay, uh, once you, you know, get your GWAS result, it's very important to validate the GWAS result. There are several ways to validate the GWAS result. And you can, uh, you know, go for statistical validation where, you know, you can compare result. There are different GWAS methods, uh, models we have, you know, uh, we have given. You can come, you can redo the analysis in each models and the result which you are consistently getting the market rate associations, you can pick up consistently. Uh, the, you know, those market rate associations, you can validate it in the statistically that way, or else uh, you can, you should biologically validate it. Uh, if you have identified a particular market rate association and you found that it is associated with a, there is a genomic region nearby, you, either you can go for a genome, a gene expression analysis of that particular gene, or using CRISPR-Cas, it's very easy to knock out the gene and identify whether any there is any trait uh, difference is there. And uh, okay, another one is replication studies. Once you identify a particular marker, you can um, uh, you can screen with those markers in a independent population to identify its uh, you know whether the marker is really associated with the trait or not. And uh, meta-analysis is uh, another way to do this. And for, you can combine the results of multiple GWAS studies. And uh, you can look for the, uh, you know, for the same trait, the consistent associations. You can identify those associations across the different populations. So, however, the association mapping has a certain limitation. It cannot be detecting rare alleles. Uh, rare alleles which are, you know, occur very low frequency because the model itself will, you know, it, it will not deal with rare alleles. And also the population, to detect rare alleles, your population should be so large enough. And also it require uh, association mapping uh, to be fully functional, it require dense marker coverage, which will be very difficult where, you know, your breeding program has been highly limited by financially. You will not be able to run so many, you know, so many number of markers, or you won't be able to afford uh, SNP chip or you know resequencing or GPS, whatever the method you use for it. And also, it will be have limited effect size, meaning the GWAS tend to detect QTLs only having higher effect size, higher you know percentage of the explained variation. Now, uh, most of these associations associations are population specific associations may not be ap applicable if that particular allele is not present in another population. Okay, so uh, now how we use this GWAS result into our crop breeding. Now, uh, I will give an overall picture here. For example, uh, in a marker-assisted selection, uh, yeah, we use molecular markers to select the plants with our desired trait. And the first step will be identifying that your target trait for your improvement. Now, Next step will be identifying molecular markers that are linked to the gene for your target trait. So this you can do by either QTL mapping or GWAS or simply a bulk segregated analysis. Now we have to develop a population of plants uh, yeah, through systematic intercrossing of the parents which are containing this particular uh, your trait of interest and gene of interest. And then again, the segregating population, you will, you know, search, you know, genotype with the molecular markers. And uh, then again, you select the, you know, again, use those uh, molecular markers for genotype the plants and select the desired alleles for further breeding. So earlier, the concept was using the molecular markers, a single marker we will use, we used to use for uh, selecting a particular gene. And yeah, this way either you can go for a marker assisted background breeding or a conventionally uh, simple marker assisted selection, which involving uh, you know selecting superior segregant using molecular markers. Now there is a concept of haplotype based breeding. So I will very briefly explain this. Haplotypes are it's a specific combination of SNPs 
or alleles at a multiple loci located on the same chromosome that are essentially inherited together since they are in LD, linkage disequilibrium. Now, uh, uh, if you see here, there are five different haplotypes are there. Five different haplotypes means there are five different combinations of SNPs, right? Each combination is unique. Now, what you have to do is that uh, once you identify these five different combinations, then once you investigate their uh, the plants which are H1, the plants which are carrying H2, and the plants which are carrying H3 and so forth, uh, once you uh, you know investigate their phenotypic expression of each haplotype groups, you find that certain haplotype groups are you know they are much performing much better compared to other haplotypic groups, right? So it is not just a single SNP is in, involved. A single SNP is not just involved in uh, expression of a trait. In most of the cases, it usually the combination of SNPs which decide the expression of a particular trait rather than an SNP alone. But the problem is if you select with only a single marker, you may not be getting the, you know, the desired result which you are looking for always. So in this case, the haplotype-based breeding is much important, right? We should be selecting for a superior haplotypes rather than a superior SNP. Now, uh, I will give you a brief outline about how to do a haplotype-based, you know, breeding from the beginning. Again, so this portion we have already discussed. If you have a population, a gem blossoms, uh, you have identified, genotyped them, phenotyped them, you conducted a genome weight association study uh, with which you have identified superior market rate association. Then you will investigate, uh, you will investigate uh, the gene of interest located. And once you, you know, narrow down your gene of interest, uh, you will essentially look for, you know, identification of haplotypes in those uh, region. And uh, once you identify the superior haplotypes, so how to identify superior haplotypes? Again, uh, as we discussed before, we have to correlate the haplotype combination with the trait of your phenotypic expression. So if you identify the superior haplotypes, the next step is to integrate this superior haplotype into your, you know, uh, your variety of your interest. So this is it can be done through a normal uh, haplotype based, uh, a normal you know forward breeding program, and this haplotype integration will give you a superior you know uh, variety. So th this one I have explained in case of a uh, stress tolerance, how to enhance the stress tolerance using haplotype based breeding, uh, it can be applicable in any trait of your interest. All you have to do is identify a superior haplotypes and its uh, timely integration. Right. So uh, here, uh, next we will, you know, uh, see very briefly about how to do a GWAS analysis. And uh, okay, first of all, I will introduce you to the data. Uh, so uh, one moment, please. Uh, Kabil, can you uh, see my screen? Yes, Abhijit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I will let you know how to arrange your phenotypic data. Right. Uh, the files are visible, right? Excel sheet. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, your data will be arranged in this way. It's a very simple way of arranging. The, you know, it's very simple format. Your genotypes will be arranged in the first columns, and uh, subsequently in each column you will be, uh, you know, your trait of interest. You 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 can, uh, you know, load your trait of interest in each columns. So here I am considering uh, days to fifty percentage flowering. So my own data this one, and in a different four locations. And the uh, this is about, uh, yeah. The 
this is about our phenotypic file now this is the genotypic file okay so uh, if you see this uh, this is called hapmap format right so hapmap format is uh, yeah all your uh, the first column will be your marker data right then the alleles if there are two alleles, you know, uh, basically the all the chip data, it will there will be two alleles, and uh, whether these two alleles, uh, what are those allelic combinations you can mention here? Here your chromosome number and its position, and uh, then these these are all optionals, and here your genotype and its genotypic information will come. So you have to make sure that it should be in the same order. The genotypic the order with genotype here is it is same as the order which genotype are presented here, right? In the same order, it should be there. And uh, yeah, and uh, you have to save it as a half map file. Then uh, before, so when you get a genotypic data, so essentially you have to curate it first. So, uh, uh, Hopefully, everybody will have Tassel with you. So, uh, Tassel is very a handy software for you know curation of genotypic data. Right. So you have to load your genotypic data open, and uh, yeah. So here, uh, there is an option called filter. So you have to go for filter genotype table sites. Right. Now, uh, there are two uh, ways to, you know, filter this data. One is you need to, uh, to get a better data, you need to remove those markers which are not genotyped in a significant number of plants right those markers if you include in the analysis basically it obstruct the analysis rather than do anything beneficial and also you need to remove those markers which are having alleles which having the minor allele frequency which is less than five percentage so if you apply these two criteria for example we have around 150 individuals here so it is just a subset of the data which i have used for my analysis suppose if you put you know, uh, if you give a missing value of uh, 10 percentage, uh, so, you know, 10 percentage of, yeah, 90, uh, 139, yeah. So we, you know, here emphasize that at least in 139 individual, the genotypic data should be present for each marker, right? Now, at least 90 percent of the population should have that particular marker data. And uh, minimum allele frequency, we can keep it as 0 0.05, right? So with this, earlier it was 31,000 markers. Let's see, after filtering, it reduced to 30,000 markers, right? Now your data is ready for GWAS analysis. Uh, let's save this data. Uh, save us, keep save us, then You can save it as a you know hap map deployed file, and simply you can save it. Now, once you save the data, yeah, you will have right. So I uh, in the training manual I have shared those scripts. You don't have to buy heart any of the scripts. And uh, it's already available in the Gapit documents. You, you can search for Gapit. Uh, Gapit is the software which, with which we, we are going to do this analysis. Gapit is a freely available R package. And it's very efficient doing GWAS and very popular too. Uh, or, or in the, uh, if you just go through the training, uh, the manual of the Gapit, you will get almost all these codes, right? Uh, we, uh, yeah, so the first step is, you know, let's make, uh, you know, set the working directory. Probably I, I hope that most of you will be, uh, will have some understanding about R. 
and uh, yeah so we will make uh, the file the directory with which carries our files let's make it as our uh, working directory now uh, these are all you know dependencies or the packages which are essentially to run this jivas analysis so we run these packages right yeah and then we fetch the source code from the gapit site right now yeah uh you can so this is our phenotypic file you can you know uh yeah this is our you know dff.txt this is our phenotypic file so you have to make sure that all these files are in a, you know uh tab delimited file text files and uh yeah genotypic file so let's take the file which we have saved. Uh, it's a filtered file, right? Gino filled this file we have to take. So uh, here in the, uh, yeah, so let's load it. Right. Now, uh, see, this is uh, y is equal to pheno. You, you know, loaded your phenotypic data, you take, taking your phenotypic data. Your, it's taking your genotypic data and PCA. Uh, here we are giving, we are considering the first three principal components, first three PCs. And, you know, this will include for, you know, uh, handling the population structure issue. And here we are going for the model blink. So that's it, the meaning of this code. And uh, yeah, once we run this, So uh, there are multiple packages are available. Another one package is uh, RMVP. Uh, even Tassel you can do. Tassel support uh, GLM and MLM model. The advantage of Gapit is it support wide range of models. So uh, you can you know try different models and select an appropriate model, uh, which gives you you know proper result. So Gapit you can see here in the console you can see what Gapit has been doing. Here, uh, you know, they are first, they are filtering for minor allele frequency. Since we have already filtered, there will not be any minor allele frequencies. And uh, then it is going to do PCA, right? Once it does the PCA, and then it analyzes the phenotypic data. Uh, it checks for the phenotypic data. And uh, yeah, then we come into the model. Probably the kinship. They must have estimated some work. Yeah, kinship is created. So kinship will take care of the familial familial relatedness issue, and uh, PCA will take care of the structure issue. So they are doing it, and then we are going for the model. So when we see here, uh, the Manhattan plots are creating. Right. So let's check our working directory. Uh, the analysis is still going on uh, since it's a four locations. Uh, the gap it will be trying to do uh, by you know trade by trade or location by location as we given in that uh, input file. Right now, if you check the working, yeah. So once the analysis you know been finished, we can check the working directory and uh, uh, we can check for the results how it coming. Right, uh, I think we can check the working directory now. Okay, so these are the result. Uh, so here, these four, you know, these four are 
x uh, you know uh, these are the result you know, here we are getting the result of location 1 location 2 location 3 so let's open the manhattan plot uh, of location 1 Right, so here we are getting almost three associations, right, significant associations. So in the location one, we are getting an association at chromosome number three and six and 12. So this line is the Bonferroni cutoff, right? Bonferroni, we can easily calculate the Bonferroni cutoff even manually also. And the cutoff actually, this is very stringent cutoff, okay? So in the cases where you are not getting sufficiently high p values uh, you know enough p values so you can relax the cutoff you know you can relax up to 3 4 it depends on the population depends on the markers you are using so the bonferroni cutoff yeah if you are using more number of markers then obviously the cutoff will be higher right as per the equation 0 0.05 divided by number of markers so it's a minus logarithm is the cutoff so if you increase number of markers it means that your uh, the string number this value will be higher the minus log based on p value will be higher right so this is for location one and similarly you will find you know uh, different different locations and uh, it's a uh, for different location or different traits you will find the individual manhattan plots for each traits now if you see uh, the result file the result file for each this is for a uh, you know location one now if you arrange the p values from the lowest to highest the lowest one will having yeah you see this is your snip this is your snip which is having highest probability meaning this is your snip which is having uh you know highest statistical significance to be called as a the market rate association for this particular location. And this is it's the chromosome a number and it's a position and it's a p-value, right? And it's effect of those those particular SNP. And uh, yeah. So what we have to do is like we can just check uh right. Other files also which give gap it outputs. So the chromosomes. So this is a chromosome wise output file. So each chromosome, it shows the association chromosome wise. Uh, the first one, the first figure, first figure, which we were uh, seeing was entire chromosomes, uh, entire the 12 chromosomes in the rice chrom, 12 chromosomes were, uh, they have depicted in a single figure here. Uh, in each figure, it's a, you know, each chromosome, right? And the one which is, here located in uh, which is showing in red is the significant association so these are all chromosome files so another file type is my circular manhattan plots the outer layer is showing the uh, snp density so each chromosome what is the density which markers are present you can see here that you know so the white portion means yeah yeah it, okay this is the end of the this so more greener means uh sorry uh more the uh red uh, red color the higher the density of snps are present now if you see this star shaped uh the star shaped ones these are all significant association so in one figure every location everything is uh, showing in one figure nothing else it's just uh, again a man as manhattan plots which is multiple manhattan plots they just you know uh merged into a circular form that's it Okay, uh, now again, if you check. So this is a percentage of the explained variation. So the first location we have identified uh, three particular, uh, three uh, market rate association. So it's a phenotypic variance they have. So the first uh, chromosome number three is having the highest phenotypic variance. The, this particular SNP, market rate association, or we call it as QTNs, quantitative trait nucleotides. Like in uh, QTL mapping, we call it as uh, quantitative trait loss. Say here we call it as quantitative trait nucleotide. So or simply market rate association. So it is showing twenty three percentage market rate association, which is fairly good. And uh, yeah, 
what else then yeah it it also give the qq plots right if you see the qq plots again it's very important qq plots see the qq plots it uh, uh, if you see this the this is again an ideal qq plot where the observed probability is exactly following the expected probability and then deviating to significant associations okay then yeah it gives again pca uh, you can see the you know pca distributions although it's not so you know very uh, a clear way of depiction but still will get an idea so these are the you know then this phenotypic files like what is the uh, whether how the phenotype and its a uh, frequency distribution okay so uh, these are all the what do you say the major yeah so these are all the results which we are going getting from jivas now let's see how we let's identify the candidate genes so for example if you take uh, you know if you take this this particular you know so we are uh, <clears throat> location one we are getting a significant marker traits association at sixth chromosome so what we have to do is we have to open a genome browser so genome browser uh, rabdb is uh, it is rice annotation project database rabdb so it's very you know for in case of rice you can use rabdb for your analysis and uh, here yeah you have to search by chromosome right so chromosome number 6 we found that association right and uh, okay so yeah so let's uh, estimate the genomic region at 250 kb visibility so what do you have to do we have to minus 250 kb from uh, this value 250 also we need to add 250 kb so we are searching 250 kb of this particular snip right uh, from its position 250 kb upstream and 250 kb downstream we are searching for a candidate genes right now yeah Right. So it means that 20 from, uh, yeah, to uh, 26, uh, 2.6 MP to 3.1 MP region we are scanning. So it is separated by two dots, right? Now if you search, we are going to get, you know, all the putative genes present in that particular, uh, you know, genomic region. So we are getting, so uh, uh, this is, this trait is days to 50% of flowering. It's a flowering trait. So we will be looking for the genes which are uh, controlling this flowering genes, uh, flowering, uh, you know, uh, days to 50 percentage flowering. So if you look, right, right. Right. So we are getting the genes which are regulating grain size, plan height, and
yeah so this is the possibly the gene which we are looking for florigen gene and uh, it's called rft1 gene it is one of the very important gene in rice for uh controlling the yeah it's one of the very important gene for controlling the long dead flowering promotion in uh, rice so the due to this gene the significant association which is showing due to this particular gene right so if you check about the gene yeah it is yeah it is flowering long day promotion and Now this gene is this is the it's a coordinates of this particular gene. If you check the coordinate here, let's see how you know closely they are located. Okay, I think I must have missed one digit there. So see, it is located, you know, within this 799 base pair, right? Within this 799 base pair, uh, hardly not even one KB, right? It is 0.7 KB. So within this close proximity, you are finding this particular gene. So uh, this is how uh, using GWAS, you know, uh, we coming to the, our trait of interest. Uh, sorry, from the GWAS result coming to our gene of interest, the candidate gene. This is how we sort of our candidate genes. Okay. Uh, so, right. Now, I think I will be ending my session here. So, if you have anyone have any doubts, uh, we can discuss it. Have any out no problem. Hi, sir. Uh, this hi. is Vikas from Swiss Semester Nerd, sir. Actually, my concern is that yeah. when, when I updated my R studio, then I am facing the problem uh, of installing and activating the package of Gapit. So, do you have any idea then that how can I activate the package when we just updated the R studio? See, uh, Gapit, there are two ways. Either are you using Gapit as a standalone package or uh, you are, uh, uh, you know, getting source source code from the site? And which so way I, you are I, using? I'm, just, I'm uh, using the uh, Gapit, package. Gapit as a standalone package. Just yes, like yes, yes, yes. You, you just load Gapit, that's it, right? Yes. Library Gapit. So uh, I think uh, one thing I could advise you that use the code which I have shared with you. Probably it will be working. Okay, thank you, sir. And yeah, so any updation happens in the gap, it uh, I think the first yes, it sir. happens through that source code. Uh, I will show you. Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Pradesham Kumar from CAU Impal. Sir, yeah. I have one question How to we, we decide the which haplotypes is superior? Uh, yeah, sure. So, this is we do through haplophenol analysis, right? So, for example, you have around 100 plants. Right, yes, and you, you have around 100 plants. In that, you did your haplotype analysis, you found that there are in uh, you genotype your population, and you found that for your that particular gene, there are around uh, four haplotypic alleles are there. Okay, so 20 plants, 20 plants, and 30 plants, 20, 20, 20, and 30 plants. Now, what you do, you take the mean of all those uh, plants which carrying specific haplotype allele. Right, then you will correlate that mean of the uh, uh, that haplotype uh, carrying plants, and uh, then you will compare the means of different haplotypes, uh, different haplotypes. So 
you will get an idea about which haplotypes carrying uh, which haplotypes you know impacts higher mean so you can pick that particular haplotype as your superior haplotypes and sir in earlier slides uh, you saw like historical recombination events yeah sir please again you want to see that yeah sure. yes sir yeah sure sure i uh, probably you are referring to this slide yes sir yes sir in yeah. say diverse germplasm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so uh, diverse germplasm means uh, they have been you know we use this germplasm land traces so they have been cultivating since without any crossing so in case of rice i would tell you uh, there is no yes. crossing it's just selfing continuously over generation by generations so it means that it is accumulating uh, if if you compare side by side each germplasm, this is germplasm one, germplasm two. These are homolo a homologous chromosomal segment of uh, same homologous chromosomal segment of different different germplasms, different different lines. Okay, and when we compare all these, uh, you know, homologous segment, you find that they are all recombined. Yeah, yeah they are all recombined in uh, different different combinations. So it means that at every point, there are certain level of recombination at maybe not everywhere, every uh, lines may carry a recombination event compared to each other, but some of the lines may carry it, right? So every uh, point, there is certain level of recombination event is happening. There are yeah. yeah, so certain level of recombination event is happening. It means that your region, your gene of interest and its vicinity uh, there is more number uh, probability that there is, there are more number of recombinants are available in your population. So that what will uh, due to which you can really narrow the window of your uh, searching for your QTLs, right? So uh, basically, you know, every both both of these analysis it it track the recombinants and the pattern of recombinants and it's a phenotypic data. And you know, here we look for the LD pattern so that uh, we compare this pattern and strike the association. So, if more number of reco uh, re recombination events are available, it means that that a window of searching for your gene of interest will be very narrow. So that's why we say that QTL resolution is so high in uh, germplasm lines. Sir, one more question. Thank you, sir, for that. Like uh, in next uh, some slides, you saw like uh, some markers associated with uh, dead dead chromosomes, which have higher log value as compared to mean. Uh, which I am sure uh, again come again, please. Sir, in log yeah. value, when we see like some markers, so association with chromosomes, like we have more mean value. So how we decide like this log value say upper wala jo markers hai, wo apne trade ke saath associate hai, sir. Ah, yeah, yeah. You are referring to this. How we decide Haan, this? Like this. Uh, yeah, how yeah, to yeah, yeah. decide in good, some good. slides you say like five, in some slide you say like 10. So... <laughs> no, no. Okay. Uh, it is not that I decide. It, it, there is a statistical method to decide it. So that's called uh, one commonly used uh, criteria is Bonferroni correction, which I have here written, right? So how to calculate is, so here 0 0.05 divided by number of markers. I can calculate right away. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, okay. If you want to see that calculator, take a scientific calculator, then if we have 31,000 markers, 0 0.05 divided by 31,000, uh, it comes around this value right now log of this value is 5.79 right minus yes, log of this value value will be coming 5.79 so approximately here around 5.79 uh there will be a line can you see that yes sir yes sir so yeah so this is how we calculate that uh, criteria on threshold or uh, above which the markers strike significance Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I have another question. Would you please uh, uh, yeah, help yeah. me? Yeah, yeah, please go yes, ahead. Sir. As you talked about the meta-GWAS analysis. Okay. 
so uh, generally we uh, for meta cuter analysis we have we have uh, published uh, uh, nearly four papers for meta cuter analysis where okay. we used biomarker biomarker uh, as a software but okay. my concern is that for uh, meta gvas analysis is there any particular software or packages in r where we can uh... do uh, I think I am not aware about the exactly for Jivas. I don't think the I think my biomarker will serve the purpose here too. Okay. Uh, you can use biomarker, but uh, okay. there there should be packages. But uh, as of now, I am not aware about it. Okay. So please yeah. share the uh, that script which you uh, you have used for installing. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, I think in the training manual, you know, they will provide okay. it. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you yeah. so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, we I am just reading the comment section here now. Uh, yeah, someone sure, is sure. asking what is the minimum population size for connecting a GWAS analysis? Yeah, so uh, GWAS minimum population size, uh, you know, there isn't an exactly, but we always say that we need a, you know, we go for a minimum population size of 150 and above uh, mm -hmm. to get a, you know, meaningful associations. So the problem with the less population size is you will not be able to find the very significant, you, you will be missing a lot. When your population size is less, uh, you will be missing the rare alleles. Already there is a chance of missing rare alleles in GWAS, but even furthermore, you, you, there is a you know a risk of missing the valuable alleles in if you reduce the population size. So uh, we say that you know anywhere between 200 to 300, also, we cannot, you know, unlimitedly extend the population size into any amount because you need to phenotype them thoroughly. So mm -hmm. most of the Jiva studies you may be referring, you'll be finding around, you know, 200 to 500 in that range. Even the less than that you may be finding. Yeah. And yeah. someone is asking that, uh, what is the minimum number of markers used for Jivas? Uh, again, so... This is again an interesting question. So I, I think I had explained it, uh, but I will re-explain it. So uh, it depends on, see the GWAS require marker dense uh, genotyping. It means that you have to use maximum number of markers, but again, it depends on your population. If your population is a gemplasm, which it means that uh, it is a very diverse gemplasm group. It means that it has been undergone thorough recombination at uh, every stages. So it means that your LD block size will be around 200 KB to 50 KB in case of rise. In other crops, you know, maybe differs crop to crop. Uh, it will be in a very narrow uh, LD block size. So you need to find markers within all these blocks without which you cannot do a GWAS study, right? So you need to have sufficient enough markers uh, which will fill all these blocks. Now, if your population is recently developed, it's a multi-parental population, say it's a a magic population or something which undergone comparatively very few round of recombination, then your LD block size will be, you know, larger. So in that cases, you can reduce the number of, uh, you know, markers to be used. But uh, it depends on the population. I cannot say an exact amount with which you should be using for GWAS. Yeah. Okay. Sir, one and... more question, like when we go for tussle analysis, how many numbers of markers is significant for that, sir? For yeah, association sorry. mapping, tassel ke liye, mm -hmm. See, minimum tassel, mark. Tassel, th there is no difference between association analysis using tassel or capit. Both of them are using the same models. Th th there is no, you know, tassel, tassel usually use uh, two models, GLM and MLM, and uh, it's available in capit also. So, you don't find, you know, there is no difference between if you use tassel, you should use this number of markers and uh, use gapet, you should use this number of markers. Again, number of markers, I say, like, it should be marker dense, dense enough to capture significant market rate association, without which it will be a meaningless study. Okay, sir. Thank you. Right. So... Thank you, Dr. Avijit, for this wonderful uh, lecture and uh, explaining Jivas. And uh, definitely, uh, this will help to our participants. And uh, we will actually upload this video to YouTube so they can uh, repeatedly they can practice. So thank you so much, Avijit, for your time and uh, uh, explaining Jivas so nicely. Uh, thank you, Vijay. Uh, it is actually even wonderful experience for me to interact with you all and 
uh, and it's a really great initiative which he and Kapil, you know, both of you are doing and, you know, reaching the science to, uh, to, you know, a large segment of people, it always benefit for the whole society, scientific society. Uh, you know, I appreciate both of you and all of the behind this effort and please keep doing it in the future also. And really thank you for your kind invitation and yeah, looking forward to meet you again all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avijit, for joining us. Thank you. So yeah. now this session is over now. We will meet tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.